Being married cost you everything. Tears, nights of sleep, incredible vulnerability and sacrifice. It causes you to take a deeper look inside your heart and soul, your desires, and your personality. It hurts. It is not easy. Marriage is hard because it is opposed. The devil hates marriage. He hates the beautiful picture of Jesus and his bride that it represents. He hates love and life and beauty in all its forms. The world hates marriage. It hates unity and faithfulness and monogamy. Our flesh is not our ally here either. It rebels when we put others before ourselves. Our flesh hates dying. But God loves marriage. The Holy Trinity is for it. God is with you. He is for you. He commands you to love, and he says that with him and in him, all things are possible. Not easy, but possible. Marriage is going to ask everything of you, and that is why you must have a vision for it. I'm Alan Arnold, and you're listening to the Ransomed Heart Podcast. I was just reading an excerpt from John and Stacy's book, Love and War. For the next six weeks, we invite you to come with us on a journey of what the marriage you've dreamed of could look like. We'll be going through the book, Love and War. Now, if you're not married, this may not seem like a message for you, but I promise you there's value in it and that you'll be glad you stayed with us. If you're single and never been married, boy, do you need to know what the cost and what the joy of marriage really looks like. If you're married and your marriage is not in a good state right now, or perhaps you're separated or divorced, this offers a message of hope of what could be, of restoration, and of God's original plan for marriage. So this is part one of our six-part series. This will be from chapter one and two of the book, Love and War. Now, here's John and Stacy. One, remembering what we wanted. Romance meets reality. Maybe we ought to just start this book here. Marriage is fabulously hard. Everyone who has been married knows this. Though years into marriage, it still catches us off guard, all of us. And newly married couples, when they discover how hard it is, they seem genuinely surprised, shocked, and disheartened by the fact. Are we doing something wrong? Did I marry the right person? The sirens that lure us into marriage Romance and love, passion, sex, longing, companionship, they seem so far from the actual reality of married life, we fear we might have made a colossal mistake, caught the wrong bus, missed our flight. And so the hardness also comes as something of an embarrassment. Don't you feel embarrassed to admit how hard your marriage is? Maybe it's just us. Nope, this is everyone. We might as well come out and say it. The sooner we get the shame and confusion off our backs, the sooner we will find our way through. Of course marriage is hard. For heaven's sake, bring together a man and a woman, two creatures who think, act, and feel so differently, you would think they'd come from separate solar systems and ask them to get along for the rest of their lives under the same roof. That is like taking... Cinderella and Huck Finn, tossing them in a submarine and closing the hatch. What did you think would happen? Now, while you're at it, toss into that constantly in-your-face experience all of our fears, our wounded hearts, our self-centeredness, our self-doubt, and our resolute commitment to self-protection. Good Lord, Anyone looking for undeniable proof in the existence of God need look no further. The fact that any marriage makes it is a miracle of the first order. Bonafide proof that there are forces in the universe working on behalf of mankind. All those fairy tales about a boy and a girl who find themselves thrown together into an adventure in a dangerous land and how they must come to work together if they have any hope of making it through, but they are both carrying a tragic flaw, an Achilles heel that pricks the other constantly, and they barely do make it through, those fairy tales pretty much have it right. In fact, if you look back at the first marriage, 
that almost fairy tale like story in Genesis, you'll see that Adam and Eve had a pretty rough go at it. And they didn't even have parents to screw them up as children or friends giving them ridiculous advice. My goodness, the fall of man seems to come during the honeymoon or shortly thereafter. They hit rough water as soon as they set sail, poor things. If this is the story of the first marriage, it is a bit sobering. But it also gives us some encouragement, too. It is normal for marriage to be hard even the best of marriages. I just wish some older man had pulled me aside a few weeks before our wedding and said, now listen to me, son. You're a fine young man. Stacy is a wonderful girl. I think you two are made for each other. I'm very excited about this marriage. But now listen to me, lad. Are you paying attention? You are also, both of you, deeply broken people. And all that brokenness is going to start coming to the surface as soon as you say, I do. Don't let this throw you. It happens to everyone. It doesn't mean you've done something wrong. But what would be wrong would be to ignore what surfaces. God is going to use your marriage to get to issues in your life he wants to address. You've got a way of making life work. And you're going to discover that Stacy does too. That's all going to collide sooner or later. You might make it a year or two on young love and thank God for it. But don't ignore this stuff when the fairy tale hits the fan. Get some help. Very few of us ever receive or listen to this kind of counsel even years into our marriage. Things become hard. We are, at first, surprised and then dismayed. Eventually, if the situation doesn't improve, we fall into resignation We check out. We disappear. Emotionally, mentally, sometimes physically. He watches television all weekend. She eats or goes shopping. I was trying to think of a good operating definition of marriage the other day, and this is what I came up with. Two guarded people managing their disappointment, negotiating for better terms through a DMZ they call marriage. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, Eve. Now, What is so hopeful about their story, Adam and Eve's, that is, which is our story too, all of us, is that God came looking for them. They had made a real mess of things, those two, and now they were holding up a fig leaf with one hand and using the other to point an accusing finger. And God got down on his hands and knees and came looking for his children in order to rescue them. Adam, where are you? Genesis 3, verse 9. Why, you could retrace these steps in every marriage that has ever followed. Some sort of Eden-like romance, or at least the promise of Eden in young love, and then a hard fall, followed by hiding, blaming, and reproach, and the grace of God offering a second chance. Let desire return. What would it look like for the two of you to find your way to something beautiful? Don't start with, how can that happen? How will come in time. We can help you with how. You have to begin with desire. Start with what is written on your heart. What was it that you once dreamed of as a young man or woman? What was it you wanted when you first fell in love? As a woman, I know what I want. I want to be seen and valued for who I am, to be truly known by my husband. That is why I loved the movie Titanic. Rose's fiancé doesn't get Rose. He recognizes that she is unhappy but doesn't pretend to know why, nor does he even ask her. Jack, on the other hand, understands Rose's heart. He sees both her outward beauty and her inward beauty. And because of that, he values her, cherishes her, fights for her. He sees Rose for who she truly is and delights in her, giving her the courage to throw away a future that seems secure for one that is completely unknown. Being deeply known by John and still loved by him, delighted in, that is a deep desire of my heart. I also want to live my life with my husband, to share in the adventure of life. I don't want to be alone in my life. 
I want to share the inward workings of my heart and the outward details of my life, the joys and sorrows, the small ones as well as the big ones. Life can be hard, sometimes cruel and often dangerous. To share it with my husband helps give me both the courage and the desire to rise to the occasion. In The Scarlet Pimpernel, the hearts and lives of Sir Percy Blakeney and his wife Marguerite become one when she understands the truth of his identity and joins in the higher call of his life. As she rises to play her irreplaceable role in the story and they share in the adventure, his life is saved and good triumphs over evil. I want to do that for John. I want to do that with John. And finally, I want to lean into John's strength. When the going gets tough and the tough get going, I want to know that John is not going anywhere, that he will be there for me to lean on when I need to, and I have needed to many, many times. Just as the Dashwood sisters in Sense and Sensibility learn the immeasurable gift of being able to lean into the strength of Colonel Brandon's character, I too want to rest in my husband's strength. I think these are the things every woman wants. As a man, I hear what Stacy just said and say, huh, wow, that's good to know. Because my desires are a little different. First, I want to be believed in. There's a scene in the movie Cinderella Man that almost brought me to tears. It's a come-from-behind story about a boxer no one thought could return. James Braddock is about to face his most brutal opponent, a Goliath who has killed men in the ring. This is the match of his life. His wife, May, makes her way across New York City, down into the basement of Madison Square Garden, finds Jimmy in the locker room simply so she can say, remember who you are. I'm always behind you. I love that scene. I also want Stacy to ride with me in some great adventure. You might remember the movie The Man from Snowy River. There's a scene in it I can still recall, even though it was more than 20 years ago when I first saw it. The beautiful young Jessica has gone missing. She is in danger. Her horse threw her high in the mountains. The strong young cowboy Jim finds her and rescues her. And suddenly, there they are, just the two of them, miles from nowhere, out in the wild beauty of the mountains. I love that scene. Wild, untamed beauty and a shared adventure. And finally, I want beauty. I want the love described in the Song of Songs when the woman says to her lover, Come away, my lover, and be like a gazelle or a young stag on the spice-laden mountains. She thinks he is amazing. She offers her beauty to him. She invites him to be the man with her. I think men will know what I'm talking about. There's a scene from the movie Hook that caught me off guard. Peter Pan has returned after many long years to Neverland. He is a grown man now. Tinkerbell, played by Julia Roberts, is thrilled to have him back. She uses her magic to zap herself into a full-sized woman absolutely dressed to kill. Peter asks, wow, Tink, what's the celebration? You, she says. I think these three desires are shared by every man listening to this. And you, dear listener, what scenes have captured your heart over the years? What songs, what stories, what moments have awakened the deep desires of your heart? You see, somewhere along the way, we all lose heart in marriage. We all do. It happens to the best of us. As Dan Fogelberg sang, joy at the start, fear in the journey, joy in the coming home. A part of the heart gets lost in the learning somewhere along the road. We might find a way to manage our disappointment and we might do our best to fight off resignation, but it works its way in. We let go of what we wanted, what we dreamed of, what we were created for. We begin to settle. Because marriage is hard, sometimes painfully hard. Your first great battle is not to lose heart. That begins with recovering desire, the desire for the love that is written on your heart. Let desire return. Let it remind you of all that you wanted, all that you were created for. 
And then consider this. What if God could bring you your heart's desire? It's not too late. It isn't too hard. You are not too far along, nor are you and your spouse too set in your ways. God is the God of all hope. He is, after all, the God of the resurrection. Nothing is impossible for him. So give your heart's desire some room to breathe. What if the two of you could find your way to something beautiful? That would be worth fighting for. 2. Love and War The vision is always solid and reliable. The vision is always a fact. It is the reality that is often a fraud. G.K. Chesterton Stacy and I hadn't made love for a while. I'm not sure of all the reasons behind that, the hectic pace of the Christmas season, probably, and the stress of our respective worlds. No, now that I come to think about it, those were the cover, the distraction providing an excuse when the real issues were all that has been stirred up writing a book on marriage together. Can you imagine doing this with your spouse? I mean, if you open that closet door, who knows what will spill out onto the floor? Pushing into questions about desire and love and disappointment has shaken us both out of that cordial detente most couples call marriage. So it had been a while. Sex can be such a stark barometer for a marriage. If things are not going well in other arenas, it doesn't take long for that to manifest in bed. She didn't seem interested in the past few weeks. I felt myself pulling away. The horizon looked bleak. So I prayed. I prayed yesterday that God would come into our sexuality. I prayed that his glory would fill our marriage bed. Warming to the task, I prayed that he would make us both as passionate as when we were young, when it wouldn't take more than a lingering kiss for the furnaces to start blazing. Inviting God in felt like the only thing I knew to do. Flowers and candy seemed ridiculous, so I called on higher powers. We made love last night, and it was good, really, really good for both of us. That dark chocolate sensuality between the sheets, the deep lusciousness of two bodies entwined, the soft beauty of the feminine form calling forth the strength of the masculine, we found our way back into the garden. If only for a moment, all those tensions that pushed us apart were simply gone. We were back in love, literally plunged into love, allowing ourselves to drink deeply the elixir of love. Sex is so mythic, you can't begin to describe it. Utter oneness, unfettered desire, awoken and offered and satisfied. When it is good, it is a window into Eden. As we lay there afterward, Stacy's head on my shoulder, it seemed that time had slipped away and taken with it all that had come between us. As waves rise, swell, and thunder onto the beach, and then wash it clean as they recede so gently back into the sea. Lying there, I knew that this is what is true. True of love, true of us, true of marriage. How did I forget? Why is it so easy to lose sight of what is most deeply true? I found myself realizing again that this is the woman I love. This is what I want, and this is what is true of our marriage. How do I find this in the daily living of our lives? There is so much set against marriage, it clouds our perception like a sandstorm. So let us return to Eden and see if we can remember together what is written deeply on our hearts. Remember the story we are made for. Our marriages are part of a larger story. The Bible begins with a marriage, and ends with a marriage. We never noticed that before. Here is the story God is telling, the story that will explain our lives, the story in which all other stories find their meaning. Open the book to chapter 1, page 1, and suddenly, there is a marriage. God put the man into a deep sleep. 
As he slept, he removed one of his ribs and replaced it with flesh. God then used the rib that he had taken from the man to make woman and presented her to the man. The man said, Finally, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, name her woman, for she was made from man. Therefore, a man leaves his father and mother and embraces his wife. They become one flesh. The two of them, the man and his wife, were naked, but they felt no shame. Genesis 2, 21 through 25 from The Message. It all begins with a couple, not some hero standing alone against the rising tide of the world. A marriage, a man and a woman, given to one another at the dawn of time. The human race is about to enter into its great adventure and its great struggle. As God begins the wild, terrifying, and beautiful story, we are introduced to the hero and the heroine, and they are married. (laughs) Well, what do you know? That's unexpected. Marriage must play some essential role in the unfolding drama. Now, flip to the end of the story. The epic tale reaches its climax with the end of the world as we know it. After the white horse and its rider appear, after the legendary Battle of Armageddon, as the whole creation reaches its denouement, suddenly we find a marriage. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, and I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. Come with me. I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. Revelation 21, verses 1 and 2 and verse 9. There in the closing pages of the book of Revelation, As the saga comes to a breathtaking finish, trumpets sound and a feast is held, a wedding feast. Marriage ushered in the age of man in Genesis, and now marriage ushers in the kingdom of God. In some sense, marriage is the kingdom of God, the purpose for which God has been fighting lo these many ages the marriage of Christ and his church, that is. All other marriages end here, for God will be united with his people. And so we see, from start to finish, the part of this great story we have been given to play begins and ends with a marriage. Holy cow! What have we been missing here? Why does God give marriage such a central part in this story of redemption? What does he know that we don't yet see? This is a love story. Well, let's begin here. This is a love story, dear friends. God is love, the Apostle John tells us. And then he says it again so that we don't forget. God is love, and the one who abides in love abides in God. 1 John 4, verse 16. Love is the single most defining quality of his character and his life. God is a passionate and jealous lover. Is there really any other kind? Out of his love, he creates us for love. We love because he first loved us. 1 John 4, verse 19. The scriptures tell us that we are made in God's image. And you'll notice that we human beings are, above all else, deeply and profoundly relational, because he is. God is Trinity, a fellowship of love. Love and intimacy are the core of his being, and so he gives to each of us a heart like his. When God does this, he reveals our deepest purpose to love and to be loved. This is, after all, a love story. Why else would love be the deepest yearning of our hearts? Isn't love the greatest joy of human existence and the loss of love our greatest sorrow? Do not the two great commands confirm this? Love the Lord your God with all your heart and your neighbor as yourself, Luke 10, 27. Love, for this is your destiny. Love God, love each other, 
The banners that fly over God's kingdom are the banners of love. It's not about Bible study and faithful church attendance, not even dutiful marriage. Take the heart out of all of that, and it will absolutely kill you. This story is meant to be a passionate love affair. I have loved you, God says, with an everlasting love. I have drawn you with loving kindness. Jeremiah 31, verse 3. We live in a love story, a romance written before the foundations of the earth. Aren't the most impassioned pleas of the Bible directed towards love? Love one another sincerely from the heart. 1 Peter 1, 22. Beloved, let us love one another. 1 John 4, verse 7. A new command I give you. Love one another. John 13, verse 34. You begin to get the sense that love is central to this story. We are urged to love, commanded to love, warned to love, implored to love, with abandon over and over and over again. Good grief. Why? Because of what is at stake. You see, This love story takes place in the midst of a terrible war. A war story. Think again of all the great fairy tales. Notice that in every last one of them, the kingdom hangs in the balance. Evil is advancing upon the land. What are they trying to tell us? The very thing the Bible has been trying to tell us? The honeymoon of Adam and Eve and their shared honeymoon with God, is barely underway when the evil one snakes in with a plan to break everyone's heart. The devil convinces the two newlyweds that they cannot trust the heart of God. He deceives them. They break the one command God gave. They reach. They fall. The beautiful kingdom is overthrown by darkness into darkness. The circle of intimacy is broken. This is why I weep, and my eyes overflow with tears. No one is near to comfort me, no one to restore my spirit. My children are destitute because the enemy has prevailed. Lamentations 1.16 Think Auschwitz. Think the killing fields of Cambodia. This beautiful love story is about to become an unspeakable tragedy. But this is a people plundered and looted, all of them trapped in pits or hidden away in prisons. They have become plunder with no one to rescue them. They have been made loot with no one to say, send them back. Isaiah 42, verse 22. Now the whole world lies under the control of the evil one. 1 John 5, verse 19. But love is more powerful than Satan thought. God will not abandon his beloved, even though we have abandoned him. He comes for us. He fights to win us back. The Lord will march out like a champion, like a warrior. He will stir up his zeal with a shout. He will raise the battle cry and will triumph over his enemies. Since you are precious and honored in my sight, and because I love you, I will give nations in exchange for you and peoples in exchange for your life. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth, everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. Isaiah 42, verse 13 and 43, verses 4 through 7. In the world's darkest moment, love shines through. In spite of betrayal, idolatry, and chronic unbelief on our part, God loves us and pursues us, and his love wins the ransom of mankind. Jesus of Nazareth, the great prince, son of the king, comes and gives his life to rescue his beloved. Christianity is the greatest love story the world has ever known. All of this is still unfolding, by the way, right now, as you listen to these words. The great and terrible clash between the kingdom of God 
and the kingdom of darkness continues. They are fighting for the human heart. At its core, this ancient struggle comes down to one question. Can a kingdom of love prevail? God insists that love never fails. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 8. Satan laughs. The world laughs. Something in us laughs too. It sounds so utterly naive. Love never fails? It seems like the most failure-prone thing on earth. We're in this together. God is telling a love story, and the setting is war. This alone would orient you for the rest of your life if you really believed it. But why marriage? Why does he give it such a central role? There are many reasons we will explore. Let us name two for now. First, because we are going to need help. The vicious battle we find ourselves in is over the human heart, if you hadn't noticed, and hearts are famously vulnerable and in desperate need of sanctuary. Marriage is meant to throw the balance of power on our side. You're going to need one another. Two are better than one because they have a good return for their work. If one falls down, his friend can help him up. But pity the man who falls and has no one to help him up. Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves, and a cord of three strands is not quickly broken. Ecclesiastes 4, verses 9 through 12. Back in Eden, when God created man and woman, he fashioned us as glorious counterparts, complements, comrades. The heart of a man longs for a battle to fight, an adventure to live, and a beauty to rescue. Just look at the movies men love and the games little boys play. The heart of a woman longs for someone to fight for her, to play an irreplaceable role in a great adventure, and to offer beauty. Just look at the movies women love and the games little girls play. Notice how perfectly the desires of our hearts fit together. Our souls are made for oneness in the same way our bodies fit beautifully together. God designed us to bring one another passionate joy. Now, if you could write the perfect love story, how would it unfold? Most of us have something in mind like this, a beautiful you and a beautiful me and a beautiful place forever. I am all for sneaking back into Eden. If we could find a way to lift our marriage up into paradise, we would all give a king's ransom to do it. But then what? Then what? If there were nothing else to the story but gazing in one another's eyes, we would be bored senseless. Tahiti for a week is a relief. Tahiti for a month is healing. Tahiti day after day with no end, why, we would be climbing the walls of our little hut. For it is also in the heart of a man and a heart of a woman to share some sort of quest, to fight some great battle together. And if we can't find a great battle, we seem to start one with each other, as if to satisfy the itch. In all the great stories, the boy and girl are thrown together in a great adventure they did not choose, and they desperately need each other if they're going to make it through. Shasta and Erevis are driven together by the lion. Mossy and Tangle are sent on a quest with the golden key. Hensel and Gretel, holding hands for fear, are making their way through the dark woods. Beauty and the Beast are learning to love so that they might be free. Even Jack and Jill need each other to get that pail of water. We love those tales. They are loved all over the world. But most of you haven't yet made the connection. The reason your heart leaps to these stories is because they are telling you about your story. Really? Your marriage is part of a larger story, too, a story as romantic as any that has ever stirred your heart and at least as dangerous. The sooner you come to terms with this, the sooner you can understand what is happening in your marriage. We cheer on the hero and the heroine because we can see what is at stake. The kingdom hangs upon their success. 
yet we haven't anything close to this sort of clarity in our own marriages. We would be hard-pressed to name one thing that hangs in the balance apart from our sanity and grandmother silver. I'll wager that 90% of the confusion, misunderstanding, struggle, and disappointment in marriage is due to the fact that we do not understand what God is up to. When I look back at the early years of our marriage, I think we both thought the story went like this. Love God, love each other, and it'll all work out. It was an extraordinarily naive view of the world, though an extraordinarily popular one. Why is it that nearly every love story turns from a scenic romance into a desperate struggle? It is because that is the story we find ourselves in. We are created to live in a great and terrifying story, and a great and terrifying story is precisely what we have. If two lie down together, they will keep warm. The picture is one of soldiers who from time immemorial have lain down back to back at night in order to keep warm in the field. God gave us to each other because we need someone to watch our back. We need someone to pick us up when we fall. How different would it be if we went to bed each night with the vision of two comrades lying down together in the midst of a glorious campaign? This is the reality, whether we see it or not. The Glory of Marriage There is no place like marriage for those desires that God set in our hearts back in Eden. For battle, beauty, and a shared adventure, the desire for intimacy, companionship, and love to come true. Friendship is a runner-up. Friendship is one of life's greatest gifts, but it lacks the constancy of marriage, the dailiness, the covenantal bond, and the consummation of sexual intimacy. It also lacks the potential to provide for the greatest transformation, our sanctification. Now, name one thing in the entire created world more precious than a human heart. It can't be done. You might say, love, but that would be silly because we cannot love without a heart. You might point to some immortal work of art or breathtaking sacrifice or some noble feat of arms, but none of those could have happened without the human hearts behind them. Even the highest heights of worship cannot be realized without the heart. There is, of course, the surpassing greatness of the gospel and the cross, but the gospel is the story of God ransoming and restoring human hearts. Without the heart, the gospel cannot achieve its intent. The heart is God's most magnificent creation and the prize over which he fights the kingdom of darkness. Now, consider this. Marriage is the sanctuary of the heart. You have been entrusted with the heart of another human being. Whatever else your life's great mission will entail, loving and defending this heart next to you is part of your great quest. Marriage is the privilege and the honor of living as close to the heart as two people can get. No one else in all the world has the opportunity to know each other more intimately than do a husband and wife. We are invited into their secret lives, their truest selves. We come to know their nuances, their particular tastes, what they think is funny, what drives them crazy. We are entrusted with their hopes and dreams, their wounds and their fears. An incredible honor is bestowed on the one to whom we pledge our lives, and a deep privilege is given to us as well. Not only is marriage good for a person, it adds an average of seven years to the life of a man, three to a woman, but married people as a whole say their lives are happier than those who are single. Married people are healthier and better off financially, and the impact of a lasting marriage upon their children is sobering. Children of divorce do not fare nearly so well in life as those who grew up in an intact family. And why is this? Because we bear the image of God. We are made in the image of love. We are created to love and be loved. And there is no greater context, no better opportunity to really love someone and to be loved by them throughout an entire lifetime than you will find in marriage. Of course, 
It is dangerous as well. The two always go together. There is no greater place for damage, too, because there is no greater place for glory. God uses marriage to bring us the possibility of the deepest joys in life. Satan tries to use it for destruction. Without you, your spouse will not become the man or the woman that God intends him or her to be, and the kingdom of God will not advance as it is meant to advance. Your spouse plays the most vital role in your life. You play the most vital role in your spouse's life. No one will have a greater impact on their soul than you. No one has greater access to their heart than you. This is an enormous honor. Pause a moment. Take a deep breath. Let that reality sink in a little deeper. You are the human being who plays the most significant role in your spouse's life. It is not your spouse's mother or father. It is not their favorite teacher, author, or pastor. It is you. It is a sobering truth, isn't it? You are on holy ground. You matter more than you thought. The Cost of Marriage Being married costs you everything. Tears, nights of sleep, incredible vulnerability and sacrifice. It causes you to take a deeper look inside your heart and soul, your desires and your personality. It hurts. It is not easy. But that does not come as a surprise to you. You already know that. Of course, loving costs everything. Look at the cross. But loving is always worth it. We all know that loving is hard. Marriage is hard. It is hard because it is opposed. The devil hates marriage. He hates the beautiful picture of Jesus and his bride that it represents. He hates love and life and beauty in all its forms. The world hates marriage. It hates unity and faithfulness and monogamy. Our flesh is not our ally here either. It rebels when we put others before ourselves. Our flesh hates dying. But God loves marriage. The Holy Trinity is for it. God loves intimacy, friendship, unity, self-sacrifice, laughter, pleasure, joy, and the picture of the sacred romance that you have the opportunity to present to the watching world. God is with you. He is for you. He commands you to love, and he says that with him and in him, all things are possible. Not easy, but possible. Marriage is going to ask everything of you, and that is why you must have a vision for it. Why do you suppose God has a seal the bond with vows, for heaven's sakes? So there you have it. We live in a great love story set in the midst of war. We need each other desperately. We have been entrusted with the heart of another human being. Our loving will prove to the world that love is real. We will play out before watching eyes the great love story of the ages. You've been listening to John and Stacy read from the first two chapters of their book, Love and War. Now, before we end, I want to leave you with some questions that you and your spouse can talk about together. These questions can be found in the Love and War Participants Guides. The first one is to ask your spouse, why is marriage hard? Now that may seem like the simplest question in the world, but it feels hard for different reasons to each of us. So it's a great time for you and your spouse to share with each other without shame, blame, or accusation, why marriage can be hard. The second question is, How do you fight for your marriage? How do you protect your marriage? It may be as simple as a date night. It it may be sitting on the back deck of your home, talking about the day together each day. But what do you do together to fight for your marriage, to fight for the joy and the hope of your marriage? And, And if you haven't been fighting for it very much, again, no shame or blame, but how can you together fight for your marriage? The third question is, what are the dreams and desires for your marriage? It's really important to know your spouse's dreams and desires and to share yours with your spouse so that you can move together 
into the future with shared dreams and desires. So spend time talking about that, listening to the other, and just dreaming about the future of your marriage together. Next week, we'll come back with part two of the series. We'll be in chapters three and four of the book, Love and War. I'm Alan Arnold. Thanks for listening to the Ransom Heart Podcast. I hope you'll be back next week.